66 years ago, Hitler was on the brink of victory in Europe. One small island stood in his way, Britain. What a bloody nerve, I mean, who this chap think he is, you know, because I think he's going to take England. So how would this country have withstood the might of Nazi Germany? The full story of the defense of Britain has never been told. It's a story of top-secret guerrilla units. Looking back, I think it was looked upon as a suicide mission. Men who are prepared to execute their own people. We had authority if we found collaborators in any of the villages around us to kill them, to shoot them. Of communist revolutionaries and a hidden network of spies. You thought, am I going to die with a bullet through me? You know, you didn't know. You didn't know. In this series, we'll discover how this country was transformed from a green and pleasant land into a bristling fortress. And find out if Britain could have repelled a Nazi invasion. We're British, and the British don't lose anything. Manning these defences was a new force, the Home Guard. This is the story of the real Dad's army. In Britain's darkest hour, there was a force that had to man the beaches against German panzer divisions and crack paratroopers. Stand out. Try and get it right. Try and stand out. Eat! <laughs> and shut! <laughs> all right, sir. The men are all ready for your inspection. Dad's army has created an enduring myth. But were the Home Guard really as bumbling as the men from TV's Warmington on Sea? The creator of Dad's Army served for three years in the Watford Home Guard. There was always that sort of atmosphere of uh, slight amateurishness. But you see, us Brits, it's amateurs that always, in the end, win. Behind the humor of Dad's Army lies the untold story of a freedom fighter from the Spanish Civil War who promised to transform the Home Guard into a crack guerrilla unit. But the story begins in spring 1940. It took the Nazi panzer divisions just days to storm through France and northern Europe. The British army beat a desperate retreat towards the coast. On the home front, it was panic stations. Pretty much everybody in Britain was absolutely convinced that there was going to be a German invasion. It seemed pretty clear to the British that they must be next. I mean, uh, Hitler wouldn't stop at the Channel. Why should he? He'd had such great uh, success in a matter of weeks. Uh, surely there would be a plan uh, for a German invasion of England. And it would come any day. We did think that if it was the real thing. We were going to be invaded and we were getting ready to do it. I've spoken to women who've... Um, ordinary housewives who said um, I'm going up into the bedroom and I'm going to pour boiling water on them when they come past. It was quite obvious that the situation was absolutely critical. We were completely alone and so at that period everything was done to prepare for an invasion. A drastic measure was taken. Throughout Britain every church bell was silenced. They would only be rung to signal that the invasion had started. It would be the loudest silence of the home front. Across the channel lay 40 German divisions. To tackle them, the British could muster just 30. These were scattered right across the country and were chronically under strength and underarmed. Vast expanses of Britain lay unguarded. So the government was forced into action. On the 14th of May, 1940, the Minister for War, Sir Anthony Eden, broadcast an extraordinary appeal on radio, calling for a new People's Army. We want large numbers of men in Great Britain who are British subjects between the ages of 17 and 65 to come forward now and offer their service in order to make assurance doubly sure. The name of the new force, which is now to be raised, will be the local defense volunteer. The public response was staggering. The War Office expected a total of 150,000 recruits, 
but within 24 hours, a quarter of a million men had enlisted for the LDV, or the Home Guard, as they would soon become known. At the end of the broadcast, we all felt there was some hope that we could take a, a, a part, and maybe a, a dynamic part, in keeping our country free. There was a realization that Hitler was something specially, impossibly evil. The government had hugely underestimated the numbers of volunteers, so local authorities were totally unprepared. Well, there was no one else in the police station, and the police sergeant obviously hadn't listened to the broadcast the following evening, probably was asleep, uh, and come on duty early in the morning. So he did his best. He wrote our names down on an envelope, literally. Did you get the enrollment form? No. Well, hadn't they got any at the police station? They wouldn't let me have them without putting in a, an application form. Well, then why didn't you, sir? They haven't got any. Oh, I see. <laughs> I got those, however. Oh, the, but look here, these, these are paying in forms. Oh, sir. don't keep putting obstacles oh. in the way, Wilson. <laughs> the very next day, after listening to the speech, I came to this spot, to the uh, old police station, and uh, there was a little bit of chaos about, and nobody seemed to know uh, what exactly was happening, but uh, uh, an officer eventually came and uh, took my name and, and placed it with others on a piece of paper, and then, then I came out. That was it. I joined. Couldn't wait to join the Home Guard. I was uh, 15 and three quarters when it the LDV was originally formed and my mother was I said I'll join because the young boys they can't wait to get killed that's why they have young boys as soldiers you don't know it isn't until you get in the real army in a real war you realize how horrible it is and I said to my mother I'm gonna join oh she said please don't please don't I said I've got to do my duty and you've got to remember we're talking now about an age that's gone forever when we were alone the new recruits were formed into their own platoons, from factory workers and miners to stockbrokers and members of parliament. The character of the Home Guard was that people were too old to fight uh, in the armed forces and too young to join. So it was a very interesting group of people with a lot of experience, but not quite the physical strength, and a lot of people with a lot of physical strength and no experience. And that was what made it so interesting. We are fit. I'm a pretty fair example of the material myself. We are prepared to form suicide squads, officers and all ranks together. The whole nation should be mobilized for action. Keep your hearts up. We know how to fight with our backs to the wall. Within six weeks, nearly one and a half million eager volunteers had enlisted. The government was totally overwhelmed. Now it had to arm and train this vast army. Before the war ended, a formidable guerrilla army would emerge. But first, the Home Guard would have to endure the Dad's Army days. I used to think it was pretty straightforward. You sorted out a pension and that was that. But now I read stuff and I'm thinking, is a pension enough? Should I be spreading the risk? Do I need to diversify my portfolio? I know one thing for certain. I'm totally confused. Make sense of investments with Norwich Union. Speak to a financial advisor. Evening Primrose Oil, only $1.99. That's a cool 63% off. You really can't afford to miss the better than half price sale. Now at Holland and Barrett. 118 is 24-7. The government had expected a total of 150,000 men to join the Home Guard. Within six weeks, ten times that number had volunteered. Now the War Office faced their first problem, how to arm and train them. I signed up and uh, weren't allowed to have a, a, a weapon. I said, when do I get my rifle? When do I get it? I can't wait to get my hands on it. Our weapons and uniforms are oh, right. yeah. Yeah. Captain Mannering, sir. Yes, come along. I think I know what you've come for. Just signed there, sir. Yes. Sergeant, call the men in outside to help her load. Oh, I don't think that'll be necessary, sir. What? There are your uniforms. 
And your weapons. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good Lord. Pepper. Pepper? Pepper. Enemy. The throwing in the face off. <laughs> Five feet. <laughs> The new recruits thought they were joining a people's army, armed to the teeth. But all available weapons had been given to the British Army, leaving precious little for the men of the Home Guard. By the left, quick march. There is a new army drilling in our midst, the Broomstick Army. Squads of keen young patriots who have waited for months their turn to be called up and are now voluntarily drilling with broomsticks instead of weapons. 65 years after they joined the Home Guard, these veterans can still remember their drill. Well, I first saw him, you know, with a, with a stick, stick trying to, you know, left turn. You yeah, handed it to your partner because we hadn't all got brooms and that, but you just went in twos and threes. And then uh, he said, oh, you two are all right, you two are all right, you do it again. And uh, you hand it over to him. Ah, oh, you can. Yes, you're not just a bad squad. Halt! It was basic, you know, very, very basic. But uh, you've got to have something to uh, to sort of do your stuff for when you've got the rifle. They promised us rifles, you see. By the left, dress. Move over, Watkins. <laughs> I can't get my arms extracted. <laughs> It was comical when I think about it. But we were serious. Stand up, eat. You can't get guards filmed, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the early days, the Home Guard had very, very, very little with which to work. Uh, broomsticks with knives uh, a lash to them weren't, weren't uncommon shotguns yes if uh, uh, somebody had them uh, but actual weapons uh, coming from uh, the war office very few and far between the bullet free phase soon ended but when the government did start to issue rifles there were rarely enough to go round over a month after they were formed, the Home Guard averaged just one rifle for every six men. Finally, after about three weeks, I got my rifle. Now, a rifle was a P-17, a P-14. They were American Army rifles used in the First World War, five shots in the, in the chamber. You carried them in your pocket. You didn't That's put them right. in the gun, not until the last minute, you know. And I went home with my rifle and my mother opened the front door. Oh, she said, you, you can't bring that in the house. Oh, it's terrible. It's got to it. Got to be here. Got to be on hand all day and night. But these vintage weapons were hardly state of the art. I prided myself on being a, a, a crack shot, which I was. I could drive in a six-inch nail, firing at the head only in about four shots. Anyway, the bullseye was about two feet across, dead easy. Aimed at the center of the bullseye, pulled the gun. I was miles out, about four feet off. And it was not until I had the last bullet of my five in the clip and fired it, continually lowering the gun, lowering the gun, inch at a time, that I got down that I could hit this bullseye. Well, the sights, of course, were never fixed. Never fixed properly. It was useless, useless, because they wouldn't have killed many Germans. <laughs> The newly formed Home Guard needed time to train and equip themselves, but they could be called into action sooner than expected. Just 12 days after the Home Guard was formed, the British began the desperate evacuation of their forces at Dunkirk. 68,000 British troops were killed or captured. Britain lay more exposed than ever. The south coast of England was now on the front line. Folkestone lay just 24 miles from the German forces in France. The War Office deployed Home Guard sentries all along the coastline. Their job, to keep watch for an invasion. Their military transport, the bicycle. The Germans soon moved up to the other side of the channel and it was rather a frightening thought to think that they were within sight. On a really clear day, one could see the cliffs of Cape Grenade just over there, and uh, it didn't seem uh, all of that 25 miles, especially uh, when the sunlight would catch 
the windscreen of a vehicle coming up the cliff and you've got a flash back from the other side. It really brought it home to one how close we were. Of course, we were in the front line down here and uh, I think all of us were very much aware that uh, at any time we could hear the warning go to say that the invasion had started. Despite their appalling lack of weapons, the Home Guard prepared for battle. The hand grenade, or Mills bomb, was standard issue for the regular army, but the Home Guard got to grips with a more basic alternative. You ready then? Yes, you've got your potato. Yeah. Are you ready for pushing the hand grenade? Left foot forward. Come on, Pin out, out. back, throw. Well, you didn't have the live ammunition, I didn't take the risk. So we'll be trained with potatoes to give us a good idea that when we got the live one, it was exactly nearly the same as having the grenade. Because the same shape as the hand grenade, and there's a pin in the top, and uh, that is the thing that you had to get your finger in. You pull the bomb back, and you put your hand in there to make sure the pin is in the hand. Now you know that the bomb now is alive. Hold the grip, and then throw the bomb, two, three, four, and down. Out the way when it explodes. You could laugh at it now, looking back, throwing potatoes, you know. It was very, very serious at the time, you know. Until the War Office could provide proper weaponry, the Home Guard would have to make do. Use your ingenuity to improvise gadgets which will increase the effectiveness of your arms. The God of Battles helps those who help themselves. Improvisation is one of the keys to success in battle. To tackle the invader, the Home Guard were taught to make their own homemade bomb. Basically, a Molotov cocktail was a petrol bomb. Petrol in a bottle with a wick, a bit of rag, light it, throw it. It would seem obvious that. You don't sort of make up two dozen of these and then keep them in the back room until, until you see tanks coming down the road because you could be there for a week. So you would be making it virtually on the spur of the moment. The thing was to have the thing ready or prepared and then armed with your wick and a lighter, right? Where can I throw it? Finally, a dummy tank arrives on the scene and is very expeditiously handled. The crew, disguised tankists, are rounded up with realism and reddish by the energetic Home Guard. Prime Minister Winston Churchill insisted that every man in the Home Guard must be armed. As there were still not enough rifles to go round, the War Office distributed a new weapon in the fight against the Nazis. The pike. And here we have an example with, with a, a 1913 bayonet on the, welded on the end of a pipe which could do a lot of damage to somebody poked in the stomach. It's ridiculous. I mean, we're talking about Agincourt now, where they stuck the huge stakes in the ground and the archers got behind it. Going out on a wet night and standing guard on a bridge, a bridge with a pike in your hand wasn't exactly the feeling that you've got the enemy at bay. Well, if I had to meet German paratroopers with it, well, I, I should be dead scared. It wouldn't take very much to just sort of to lunge forward and again uh, withdraw and, and you, you got a little there there and that's to let the blood out. We used to do bayonet training and they had sex with a face to look like Hitler on. All I can remember is trying to look aggressive, lunge forward and jab the, the steel in once, twice and hopefully achieve the objective and quickly withdraw and bunk away. Now, the main thing, you've got to scream when you charge. And they say, get the bush here, after the charge. And remember, they don't like it up on you, know. They do not like it up on you. A quarter of a million pikes were produced, but the commanders were usually too embarrassed to distribute them. So, desperate to appease Churchill and the Home Guard, the War Office attempted to issue weapons that could tackle German panzer divisions. 
but all they could muster were eccentric prototypes and army rejects. They issued at one stage a spigot mortar, which in my opinion was more dangerous to the operator than it was to the enemy, because they used to uh, fly back after exploding and uh, I, I didn't like the things at all. Sticky bombs, they were dreadful. You, you press the catch which opened up this metal bit and you wandered up in a rather nonchalant man manner to the nearest German tank and you stick it on. Now when you press it against the tank, there's glass inside which breaks and that gives you eight seconds to get out of it. But you're not allowed to run away. You walk up, you stick it on, as soon as you've stuck it, you turn round and you walk away in an orderly fashion. This was to give you, you know, train you. You see, what people don't understand is when you've got lots of real stuff, people get bloody killed. As a 17-year-old in the Home Guard, Robert Bernard came face to face with tragedy very early in his young life. The uh, firing range had been improvised and we had to put out guards because we knew that the rifle range was unsafe and also there was no way of preventing people approaching um, and obviously there was a good chance of an ex accident. So we put out guards, uh, well I think there were only two, one of them was my friend and we then fired, there were 12 of us, we fired the, the rifles more or less accurately, nobody will ever know. But unfortunately, one of the rounds ricocheted off a stone or we've no idea what, and we don't know whose. And it hit my friend uh, around the midriff, and um, he bled to death. We didn't even miss him when we um, got up, packed up, and went go off, and, and then suddenly realized that he hadn't come in from his guard duty off the range. And uh, when we went to look, we found him uh, dead in a pool of blood. He'd, he'd died there. To this day, the family of the victim has not been told how he died. His identity still cannot be revealed. Amateur soldiers and poor weaponry was proving to be a dangerous cocktail. A man in the Home Guard was four times more likely to die in training than a regular soldier. Then, on the 16th of July, 1940, Hitler issued Directive 16, which ordered the Navy, Army and Air Force to prepare for a cross-channel invasion of Britain. The Home Guard were convinced that they were about to see action. I think the fighting came into it first, yeah. you know. And when I, I volunteered, I, I, I thought, well, uh, we're going to do something of this, and then you get some bright fat who, who, who wants to... to to get you marching and things like that. Come up back. close and shout at you. What's what we doing this for? Let's get down to how to fire the gun, how to do this, that and the other, you mm. know? But now that the Home Guard had been equipped, how were they going to take on the most formidable fighting force in the world? Many of the officers had learned strategy in the First World War. Called back into action, it was a dream come true for some armchair generals. I think our commanding officer resembled like Captain Manry. One of his basic ideas was his love of what was called pincer movements. Now, what a pincer movement was, was where groups of soldiery went round on the, on the flanks yep. and cut off the enemy. Actually, it was a Zulu tactic, actually, and they caught the, the horns of the bull, I think, who, you know, this was their approach. And, and his idea was, was, this is what we're going to do, man. We're going to have one of these pincer movements, yeah, and we're going to entrap the entire German fighting force. And then all we need to do is just kill them all, as it were. Forgetting, the, totally forgetting that on the opposite side of the perimeter were your own men. But we practiced these games on some wasteland, complete with lumps of brushwood, so that the enemy couldn't see you moving about. Tactics. Strong word, that tactics. I don't think we really had any. <laughs> With no guidance from the War Office on training or tactics, Home Guard units devise their own elaborate battle plans to take on columns of German tanks. 
Alan Laurie was a 19-year-old student studying history at Cambridge University. The job that uh, I and a Professor Black, Professor of Classics at the University, um, were given was to defend the bridge with a Stokes mortar, which was a sort of drain pipe uh, on legs. Uh, but the plan was more complicated than that. Here, if you can imagine, it is the road through the village with a right angle bend and another right angle bend into the village. And this is the mill bridge, which is a humpback bridge. And here we had stationed our Stokes mortar. And the tactics were as follows. The first panzer tank to arrive, we allowed to cross the bridge, go around the corner, and when it was in that strait, it would be blocked by mines in front and mines behind. So it was trapped. And at that stage, they would fire at it with everything they'd got. Mill bombs, um, uh, Molotov cocktails, and small arms, and try and set it on fire. Now, the second panzer, however, belonged to the professor and myself. And along came the panzer, and when it was on the crest of the bridge, we would fire our Stokes mortar and destroy it, which meant that another tank was knocked out and the bridge was blocked and the panzer division couldn't reach Rochester. I think the plan was very, very flawed in every way. As soon as anybody had fired at them, uh, these tanks would have shot off hundreds of rounds and destroyed everybody in sight. But it seemed to make something we could do. And I think doing something was probably what the Home Guard existed on. The War Office had little time to organize hundreds of thousands of part-time soldiers, so local commanders were given free reign to test out their own strategies they began to assume more and more bizarre forms. Makeshift marines patrolled the rivers in converted pleasure boats. Dogs were taught to disarm enemy paratroopers. And so the skating section goes into action, and that means action. And the specialist force was trained to roller skate into battle. It was now clear that the War Office was unable to turn the Home Guard into a credible defence force capable of taking on crack German troops. When you work out the kind of army they got, you know, they'd have slaughtered a lot of us, you know, no doubt about that. Yeah. What's that supposed to be, boy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you said if you had nothing else, but it's hard carving knife to a broom handle. I didn't say keep the brush on the end of it, you stupid boy. Well, he should have stayed. I don't want any insubordination. Dad's army, of course, shows the Home Guard as rather amateur and rather bungling. But we need to remember that, especially in the early days, it was amateur and it was bungling. But in the summer of 1940, Home Guard training would be transformed, not by the government, but by a former communist revolutionary. Nice car, mate. Take a look at the stunning new Astra. Go drive. I'm angry with my mum for doing this. I know that I know that she didn't ask for cancer and she doesn't she doesn't deserve it. But if she hadn't have smoked, we wouldn't have to be doing this. More than anything, I, I feel like I've let my children down. It's the gamble. I took it and I've lost. For help giving up, call 0800 169 0169. Who wants to buy a bucket? I'm in. Who wants to build a road? I'm in. Who wants to fight disease? I'm in. And ensure people have the right to earn a decent living? I'm in. I'm in. Who wants to help end poverty once and for all? I'm in. With your help, we can make this world a fairer place. 
visit oxfam dot org dot u k forward slash i'm in or text in to eight seven zero double nine by july nineteen forty many in the home guard were fed up with the old-fashioned training and poor weapons but one man had a vision that would transform the home guard world war one veteran tom winteringham was a former communist who had volunteered to fight against the fascists in the Spanish Civil War. Tom Winteringham had led the British battalion in the Spanish Civil War. He had actually fought guerrilla warfare, and this is what he was convinced was the only way of resisting the Nazis in 1940. In Spain, he had observed a people's army at work, and he had come to develop a training course in guerrilla warfare, which he'd become quite expert on. Tom Winteringham had written a book called The People's War, in which he explained how guerrilla warfare would be organized. Very, very primitive, but guerrilla warfare is very often sufficiently powerful to defeat the most powerful enemy in the world. Winteringham was one of the leading journalists of the time and was a regular columnist for the best-selling paper, The Picture Post. And one night he was eating with the editor, Tom Hopkinson, and the owner of The Picture Post, Lord Halton. And he said, look, I want somewhere where I can teach the def defence volunteers how to let off bombs, blow up tanks, how to learn guerrilla warfare, how to garrot German sentries, and so on. And Halton said, I've got a friend, Lord Jersey, and he owns Osterley Park, so why not come to Osterley Park and form your training school here? In the unlikely setting of a stately home on the outskirts of West London, Tom Winteringham created the first guerrilla training school in Britain, embracing a whole new form of combat that prepared ordinary men to tackle an occupying army. On the 10th of July, 1940, Osterley Park opened its gates. Volunteers flooded in from across the country. Well, it's extraordinary, just being here again after 65 years, July 1940. But I don't remember exactly, but I think I'd read an article that Tom Winteringham had written in one of the papers about this. And I said to a school friend of mine, we got the summer to fill in before we went into the Air Force, let's uh, go and have a look. So we got on the tube, came to Osterley Park to walk down here, looked at this field, there was about 40 or 50 miscellaneous chaps standing around as they were waiting for a pick-up football match to start. And that was it, and we were in the first intake. The functions of the Home Guard are thus becoming pretty clear and an intensive training school which has no illusions on the subject has been started at Osterley Park. Winteringham assembled here an extraordinary range of teachers. Many of them came from Spain and the Spanish Civil War. There was, for example, Hugh Slater from Spain, his number two. There was a desperado called Hank Levi. Life magazine had a portrait of him and they called him looks tough, is tough, fights tough, the master of the quick, quiet kill. There were two Basque miners who were experts on gunpowder. At the other end, incredibly, there were rather unworldly types, like Roland Penrose, the painter who taught camouflage, and the chief scout, Stanley White, who taught woodcraft. And one mustn't forget Mad Major Vernon, who had actually been convicted of treason in the mid-1930s for spying for Russia, but he was in charge of bombs. It's not surprising the whole lot terrified the war office. Osterley Park became the most sophisticated training centre for irregular warfare in the country. When you came in here, within ten minutes, they got the thing going and you were off. There was no filling in forms, there was no hanging about. It started right in on it. Old-fashioned army training was thrown out the window. The priority was for every individual to learn how to think and act for themselves. The training here consisted of a two-day course. There was absolutely no drill, no uniforms, uh, no, no, no hierarchy at all. It was how to fight a guerrilla war. Within 20 minutes, you were digging a foxhole, or you were learning how to stalk somebody, or how to creep up on the back of a sentry and kill him at night, how to make a hand grenade out of dynamite and a piece of piping. And learning to do that gave you a lot of confidence. You felt you, could, you might have to use it next week. This is where Mad Major Vernon kept the explosives. Imagine that full of, full of bombs of one kind or another. 
Uh, he and his Basque miners from Spain taught all kinds of bomb making, uh, grenades, Molotov cocktails, mortar bombs, etc. They also taught how to make the gunpowder, where to buy the saltpeter and for how much and so on and from what chemists. All highly illegal today, but th those were, these were desperate times. And in fact, all over Osterley, you would find some kind of irregular war training going on. Of course, there was a big rifle range. But there were also tank traps. There was a street outside with houses due for demolition where they taught street warfare, imagining last-ditch defence of towns. And that was taught nowhere else, not even in the regular army. Every corner of Osterley Park was converted into an elaborate military training zone. Even the most unlikely objects could be adapted into potential weapons. The tank, everybody knew after the Blitzkrieg in Europe, that was the main threat. But what were a bunch of amateur soldiers going to do about that? We had no anti-tank weapons. But there were some very simple things you could do. You had to slow a tank down before you could get at it. What can you use? A simple dinner plate out of the kitchen, or a group of them. Put them down in the road and slightly cover them with earth in this sort of way. And this would slow a tank down, because he'd see it and think it were landmines. That gives you a chance to come from out of your cover and attack the tank with grenades. You're a dead duck if you can't get within six feet of the tank. So, you, But once you were close to the tank, you were out of the range of the tank's weapons, which couldn't be depressed. So two people attacking from each side, the grenades, would go for the tracks, which are the most vulnerable part. You might be lucky. In 1940, Stuka dive bombers were a terrifying part of the Nazi blitzkrieg. So here, they taught the guys how to bring them down. From this tree, they suspended wires. On the wires, there were model Stuka. The idea was that you lay on the ground here, and you try to bring down the Stuka with a 303 before it could reach the ground, and no doubt blast you to smithereens. Sounds incredible, but Wintringham reckoned in Spain, he and his men had actually brought down fascist aircraft using 303 rifles. 5,000 volunteers were trained in the first three months, including soldiers from the British Army. And the school attracted huge press attention from across the world. Ostley made a huge impact right from the beginning. It had cover stories in the Illustrated London News, Sphere magazine. Radio wanted to do a documentary about it. American journalists wouldn't stay away. It had more column inches in the American press than the British cabinet. It was hugely popular, and quite rightly so, because it was actually teaching guys what they wanted to learn. It was absolutely on the nail and practical. Osterley Park, where members of the Home Guard are undergoing a course on, roughly speaking, the scientific destruction of the enemy, received a visit from a group of MPs. Surely more schools of this kind are needed. We all want to know the best way of handing out cocktails to unwelcome guests. At first, the government appeared to support Osterley Park, but its interest was double-edged. Despite the school's enormous success, Wintringham's communist past provoked deep concern in the corridors of power. MI5 was worried by Osterley because it was led by the Red Revolutionary, and they didn't like the thought that all these uh, subversives or potential subversives were running around teaching people to make bombs. They just didn't think that Basque miners were the right sort of chaps to teach the Home Guard how to resist the Nazis. They didn't know where it would lead. And in the summer of 1940, anything could have happened, even some kind of revolution. The government could take no chances. After just three months, the War Office moved in, and the army took control of Osterley Park. Wintringham and his team were pushed aside, and even prevented from becoming officers in the regular army. It's sometimes said there was a political agenda, and this was a bunch of socialist revolutionaries at the end of the Piccadilly line uh, who were planning to use the Home Guard for an insurrection. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's total bunkum. Tom Wintringham would never be acknowledged for his groundbreaking training, but the impact of Osterley Park was immense. The government was so impressed by the training that three more specialist Home Guard schools were rapidly set up. Across the country, techniques that had been pioneered by Wintringham and his team would become standard Home Guard training. 
whatever would be able to be used to kill and destroy and remove the enemy was fair. And it was all guerrilla warfare, hit and run. In the following months, the new training would transform the Home Guard into an impressive fighting unit. But it wasn't just Wintringham who attracted the attention of MI5. The secret services were on red alert and encouraged the whole population to watch out, not just for invading forces, but also for enemies within. Fired up by the government, fear of subversives and collaborators reached almost hysterical proportions. The country was gripped by paranoia and German spies and fifth columnists appeared to be everywhere. Das ist gut. Sehr gut. The fifth column was the name given to what were believed to be a vast network of spies and saboteurs put in place by the Germans before the war. It was pretty obvious that the fifth column were quite active in this area, but personally speaking, I can't say that I ever met up with any such suspicious character. But of course, we were warned enough by posters um, <clears throat> around everywhere, careless talk costs lives, and so most of us were on our guard. You were aware of the mm. fifth column, and, and, and you'd look at all strangers. Mm. Do you see the way he walked? Do you see the way he talked? Strange. He looked funny. And he, he, said, he said something that was against the war. Must be a fifth columnist. The Home Guard was dispatched to patrol any potential target. Nowhere was safe from Nazi saboteurs. My duty was to guard this reservoir. Uh, there may be, we thought, that supposedly a fifth columnist could creep up with a 20 litre tin of cyanide, or indeed parachutists from the, from the sky. Remember, this was 1940, and we were, you know, we're dead scared. In fact, on the Thursday night guard, on one occasion, there was obviously a very nervous home guard uh, because he came up against some bushes on the reservoir, and they were rustling. Something was behind these bushes, and. Um, he sort of brought his rifle up and said, Holt, who goes there? And the rustling still went on. Holt, who goes there, else I'll fire. The rustling still went on, with a slight pause. And he fired, and there was a great thump on the other side of the bushes. And when he walked round, I'm afraid there was a dead white horse strewn on the ground. The fifth column fear was very great indeed. However, the actual fifth column was, as much as anything, a figment of the popular imagination, although it should be said that uh, government departments believed in it just as fervently as the public. But the hysteria reached a peak in the autumn of 1940. The sound that the whole country had been dreading rang out across the country to signal that the Nazi invasion had started. We won't be a second. Should we? Nah, more than give you a car insurance quote in a couple of minutes. It's dead easy. Lucky. Uh, nice car, Tom. Yeah. Hey, look, I've got my quote. That's lucky. Andy says I could save even more if I buy online. more than lucky. Save more on car insurance when you buy online at morethan.com. Superior flat screen technology from Hitachi. A great picture, whichever way you look at it. In the autumn of 1940, 
the fear of a Nazi invasion reached its peak. The whole country was on red alert. Hundreds of thousands of volunteers were prepared to fight for their country. And one night is etched in the minds of many of these men. A night that shows just how ready they were for invasion. On that day of September the 7th, of course, we had the real alarm, and it was not a false alarm. We thought that the invasion had actually started, and uh, because there was an awful lot of activity, a great deal of air activity, and of course the church bells ringing was a clear sign. The pealing of the church bells swiftly spread across the country. This was the signal for the Home Guard to mobilize. There was a, a code word, Cromwell. And Cromwell meant simply invasion imminent. And that would be broadcast, that was the, that was the call to action. I had to cycle round various days, and uh, I had to knock up all the people who were in my own particular platoon. I may have been in bed a quarter of an hour, it was longer if that, and there was this rattling on the window, which was somebody throwing gravel up to the window, see? So it was still I never thought, like, you know, you'd, you'd, never, you'd never expect these things like this. So I got out, opened up the window, see, and the chap standing there was an old farmer who was the, one of the blokes that had a telephone, so he said, I've had a message from Captain Kendall to tell you that the code word is Cromwell. I was absolutely dumbstruck for seconds, you know, with the knowledge that there was going to be a German invasion of England. You know, I couldn't believe it. The Home Guard rushed to take up their positions. Every man knew his job. Eric Higgs and his platoon of 19 men rapidly set up their roadblock. We had no time to put a tea in the flask. Didn't say, oh, I'll make a cup of tea first, did you, Hack? You grabbed a bike. I was still putting the uniform on. I went up across the fields that night. Grabbed the bike and the gun and shot down here. The 7th of September, 1940, we were brought to this very spot to patrol and keep guard. The sight that met my eye was uh, women appearing uh, as if by magic uh, with broomsticks and uh, rolling pins and all sorts of peculiar gardening weapons and coming, coming out and brandishing these because they were quite sure that I was a German parachutist. But the women, sadly, um, they, they then handled me and uh, push, pushed me off the bicycle. I managed to, after a bit, recover and continue on my rounds. And then, of course, I got to another part of Basingstoke, and it all started again. Once in position, the Home Guard then had to wait for the expected invasion. They were going to land all the way down the coast beyond Weymouth and right around as far as Land's End. They were going to land all right, no doubt about that. It was, nobody knew if it was going to happen. You know, to be standing here and walking to and fro, and, and any minute you might see boats coming in to the shore, etc. It, uh, it was a bit daunting, really. Well, I think the main thing was going through my mind, and through most people's minds was, how will I come out of it? How am I going to feel? Have I got a chance to put a bullet through a German? Should I do it? If the Germans had come, I don't think I should be standing here because we, we would have... The ammunition that we had, and even if we killed somebody with every bullet we had, there was no way could we stem a flow of, of soldiers. The agonizing wait went on throughout the night. Well, when morning broke, there was great sighs of relief. Uh, nothing had happened, and we were all thankful for it. I haven't been here since. This is the first time since that night. This little brown bird began to sing. That's a lottery, of course. Eh? And then we heard something else, and then it was daylight. The company man came up, he said, OK, boys, stand down. 
The false alarm revealed an ill-equipped band, but in a high state of readiness. Throughout the war, the Home Guard stood alert to leap to the nation's defense. Their battlefield would have been the towns and villages of Britain, their last line of defense, their homes and villages. And now the war is over, and we shall march no more. But in the club we want to keep an ever open door to all those who in the grim dark days marched side by side were pals always prepared to fight for England to keep old England free. Next week, one of the great untold stories of the war. While the Home Guard was being licked into shape, Britain embarked on the largest building scheme ever undertaken in its history. But the evidence of this remarkable story is rapidly disappearing and almost forgotten. Now, archaeologist Francis Pryor uncovers the remnants of these defences, revealing a picture of Britain that has lain hidden for over 60 years. And ultimately, he discovers whether these defences would have worked by putting to the test Hitler's original plans to invade Britain. The Nick Broomfield season continues on more four with Eileen, the life and death of a serial killer. That's tomorrow at nine o'clock. The next here on Channel 4, it's the episode you cannot afford to miss. ER. Well, the only thing I know for certain is that these are bad people. That's it, three.